Well, it goes without saying that during the course of these meetings, I, I, I hope that the focus will continue to be Christ. Um, tonight, I want to just focus a little bit on something that has become an issue because I hear this question from many people and perhaps it's one of the questions that I myself have had to be asking myself as well. You know, nobody denies, ever since 1888, nobody has denied that the message of Christ and his righteousness is the most wonderful thing that we can come to understand. I mean, I think Ellen White described it as a most precious message. And that was probably just an echo of what the other pioneers said, you know. But I think from that time until today, people have still been trying to get their teeth into the experience of the message. I, I think we can't help feeling sometimes a little bit impotent and a little sense like, man, we understand so much. Lord, why are we just not over the over the brink why are we not over the the brow of the hill and now rejoicing and basking in the apostolic experience and i want to talk about something tonight that i believe will just help us a little bit it it, it it's something i think that we're all aware of but i want to emphasize it in a way that i hope will bring home the truth to our hearts in a meaningful way i want to talk tonight under the, the heading of the knowledge of man. I think, as I've come to understand it, that's one of the critical things that perhaps we need to understand. You know, we need to understand the nature of the law, the nature of sin, the nature of righteousness. But I think we also need to come to a proper understanding of man. And I'm going to use, as the foundation of my presentation tonight, a verse that we find in John chapter 3. John chapter 2. And I'd like you to turn there with me. John chapter 2. And I'd like to read a, 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 a couple of verses here. Now this is one of the, the passages that gave me a little bit, bit of a problem for, for a long time. And then I heard people give an explanation of the, this passage that, that did not satisfy me. And I'm going to ask you to read it with me. It's John chapter 2, and I'm going to read from verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now you have to think as you read this verse that this is exactly what we would like to see happen. We would like people to come to believe in Jesus. And in this case, it was the works of Christ himself that made these people believe in him. I think right at that point you'd be ready to baptize these people. Or welcome them with open arms. That is why the next verse is a little surprising. But it, because it says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Because he knew all men. And needed not that any should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. Now that's interesting and it, it always was a bit of, of a puzzle to me because you know I thought well man these people believe in you and, and you said belief is what we need. So here are people who believe in Jesus and the Bible says he did not commit himself to them and there's a reason why he did not commit himself and as, you, as, as I look at myself and as we look at ourselves you have to ask the question does the same reason exist today? Are there people who believe in Jesus, perhaps in this very congregation, and yet Jesus does not commit himself to them? And what does it mean for Jesus to commit himself to me? I mean, that word reminds me of the experience of a woman and a man when they get married. They commit themselves to each other, right? What is mine is yours, and vice versa. No in inhibitions, no limitations, no reservations. When you commit yourself to each other. It speaks about a wholehearted giving. And here it suggests that even though people believed in Jesus. He did not give himself to them wholeheartedly. And there was a reason. The reason was. He knew what was in man. 
And this understanding of what is in man, it seems, is one of the reasons, or is the main reason, or is the only reason why Jesus does not commit himself to people. And I want to apply that to us this evening because I don't think any of us in, in this room can deny that. We desire a far greater experience with Christ. We desire him to give himself far more wholeheartedly. I have felt the sense of impotence so many times. I mean, even when I've been in the presence of somebody sick, I've been in the hospital, or even, even in a home setting where I've heard somebody crying for pain, and I had to leave because I couldn't stand it. And I could not put my hands on the person in confidence that the Lord would, would heal, heal the person. I've been in situations like that. I'm sure you have been in other situations where you have, you have wanted so much to see the apostolic experience alive in you. And it has not been true. Is Jesus hard of heart? Is he so uncompromising and unyielding that no matter how we cry and how we desire and how we wish and how we understand, he does not commit himself to us? I mean, this verse suggests that whatever it is that is in man, that Jesus knows is the reason why he does not commit himself to many people. You know, I've heard, I've heard people interpret this verse to say that Jesus knows what is in man because he came with our sinful flesh. And so he knew from experience, personal experience, what is in man in the sense that he knows what human nature is. It may be partially true, but you have to think, if, if what Jesus knows is in man is what was in himself, then something is wrong because that means he would not have committed himself to himself either. There's something in man that did not exist in Jesus because he was committed to himself and to his work. But he knew that something existed in, in men generally so that when people say, I believe, he still reserved himself and he kept his distance because he knew more than people know. I want to use the experience of one of the disciples of Jesus this evening to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. And the person I want to use as an illustration is Peter. But I want to ask us a question first of all, or a couple of questions. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hands, but I want you to think about the question. Do you believe that you have been called by Christ? I want you to think about that question. Do you believe that you have been called by Christ? I would expect if I asked you to put up your hand that everybody here would say yes. Except the, except the people who are not Christians if there is any such person here. You would say yes, I was called by Christ. Have you ever made sacrifices for Christ? I think most of us would say yes. I mean, I thought I made some sacrifice when I gave up my job as a teacher and I became a preacher. It might not seem like it was much of a sacrifice when I look back today, but at the time, man, it was a sacrifice. I left my job. I had a wife, and I had three children, and I was paying rent. And I had no idea how I was going to live. I just had this conviction that God wanted me to work for Him. And on the blindness of that conviction, I resigned my job, and I didn't even know where I was going to preach, how I was going to preach, and, and not surprisingly, everybody said I was mad. My wife probably was thinking it, but she never said it. And I thought I made some sacrifices in my life. And, and, and there are others of us here who have probably made similar sacrifices. But I want to show you something. If you have been called by Christ, nobody here has been called as certainly as Peter was called. Would you agree? I never heard the voice of Christ. I never heard a literal voice. I never saw his form standing on the shore saying, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. I never heard it. It was through circumstances over a period of time that I gradually grew into the faith and the conviction that I was called. But Peter heard the voice of Jesus. He saw him standing there and he heard when he said, follow me. 
He was called absolutely definitely. And did I make a sacrifice? Man, Peter left his job that instant. He never asked, how am I going to live? How is my wife going to be taken care of? The Bible says he dropped his nets and he left all. And he followed Christ. If I have a reason to think that I have been called, Peter had a far greater, greater reason. Sometimes I think I love the Lord. Sometimes I think I have to love Him because I've stuck with Him for 34 years. And I've been through some difficult times. Sometimes I think I love Him. But I'll tell you. Do you think you love the Lord and do you think that you have demonstrated it? Peter, far more! Did you ever cut off somebody's ear because you love Jesus? Man, when you took your sword and attacked a member of the police force, well, I'll tell you, I don't know how it is here. But in Jamaica, you're signing your death warrant. To attack a member of the police force in public, you might as well make sure you dig your grave before. Because you're not, you're not leaving that scene alive. And it was the same thing in Peter's day, in that kind of situation. When he attacked the servant of the high priest, when they came to arrest Jesus, it was, because, it, it, it was, it was as good as saying... I'm ready to die. That was the kind of loyalty and love Peter had for Jesus. None of us has faced that yet. I, I think I, I can, I'm telling the truth. I don't know. Maybe I don't know all your circumstances. But I hardly think anybody has gone that far in demonstrating their loyalty and love for Christ as Peter did. You can't doubt Peter's love for Christ. You can't doubt that Peter trusted Jesus. One time Jesus made a statement and he said if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood you cannot be my disciple the, the word of God tells us that instantly many of his disciples stopped walking with him Jesus looked at the twelve and he said will you also leave me? Peter said always Peter who shall we go to? you have the words of life and we know and are sure that you are that Christ, the Son of God. Did he trust Christ? Did he believe in Jesus? Man, we, we believe Jesus is the Son of God. We have made a ministry of it. We have built our message on that truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Peter knew. And Jesus could say to him, flesh and blood did not, did not reveal it to you. But it was my Father in heaven who made you know this thing. Peter, everything that I have that makes me think I am a Christian... Peter had in greater measure. It was demonstrated more forcefully in his life. Sometimes I think I have faith. One time when I was building my house, the back of it wasn't properly sealed up. And one time it rained for three days without stop. And I remember that Friday night. Friday night you want to rest and you want to get to your bed and you want to have a good night's rest and be ready for the Sabbath. And the water started coming right through the wall. And it was flooding the little, the, the little the, the couple of rooms that we had. And I got a bucket and I got a, a cloth and I started drying the water. And after I dried about half an hour, the thought came, how long are you going to keep this up? I mean, you can't stop it. It's coming, it's, the, the wall, is, the wall is, is seeping. It's not coming at any particular spot. The whole wall is just running water. And I'm drying, otherwise you're going to be flooded out tonight. And after half an hour, I'm thinking, how long are you going to keep this up? Three days the rain has been falling without cessation. And the thought came, why don't you pray? And I pushed it from my mind. Pray to God about rain falling. This rain has been falling three days, man. And I mean, I can dry water. Why should I ask God? And the thought came back, but he's your father. I mean, just because I'm his child, if I say... Please stop the rain. He's going to stop the rain. Be realistic. It has been raining for three days without one moment cessation. And the thought came again. But he's your father. And he cares about every little thing. And he said, Lord, I can dry water all night, but it's going to be hard. It's Sabbath night. Lord, please make the rain stop. I wiped water for one more minute. And I heard. I said. 
No, that's not possible. <laughs> but it was. Not another drop of rain. Sometimes I think I have a little faith. But you know something? I never in my life ever walked on water. I never trusted Christ enough to walk on water. Twice I nearly drowned. All right, I was in a situation where I could have drowned. And I was desperate. I had no confidence to walk on water. I cried to the Lord, yes. But I never had that kind of faith. Peter did. And I tell you something, it was not Jesus who called him to walk on the water. He initiated it. He said, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. All Jesus did was say, come. And he stepped out with absolute confidence in Christ. And walked on water. Peter, it seems, had everything that we desire as Christians. That is why this statement is so startling. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. This was near the close of Christ's earthly ministry. Turn to Luke chapter 22. I want to read from verse 31. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art, what? Man. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now, that seems almost an impossibility. That somebody who walked on water, went about healing the sick. Somebody who was ready to die for Christ. Somebody who left his job for Christ. Somebody who, who heard the voice of Christ calling him to discipleship was still not converted. It makes you ask the question, what really is conversion? It makes you ask the other question, am I converted? It made me ask that question. The call to discipleship does not mean that you are converted. Aha. All of us have been called. But are you converted? The fact that you believe in Jesus does not mean that you are converted. So did Peter. The fact that you have seen miracles does not mean that you are converted. The fact that you have walked about with Jesus for three and a half years does not mean that you are converted. And Jesus, well, Jesus does not commit himself to unconverted people because being unconverted means something. And Jesus knows what is in man when a man is unconverted. I haven't come to that point yet, but I just wanted to say that. To love Jesus does not mean that you are converted. You, you don't love him as much as Peter did, I don't think. To trust him does not mean that you are converted. So did Peter. I'll tell you, but one thing you can know for sure is lack of conversion can survive the time of peace, but it does not survive the crisis. And we have all been living in the time of peace, and we might deceive ourselves that we are converted because, look, we have got all the criteria, and we have been called, we trust, we love, we have worked, we have been in the fellowship of the converted. We ought to be converted. But it is only when the crisis comes that we know for sure. Well, we can know before, but I'm telling you, unconversion will not survive the crisis. So, we come to the question. Of course, we come to the question, what really is conversion? Jesus gives us a clue when he, he says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3. And I'll read quickly. Matthew 18 and verse 3. Jesus said, Verily, Verily, I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, uh, I, I understood this to mean 
that conversion means that you're willing to forgive and you're willing to forget. Somehow I got that idea in my mind and that's the idea that stuck there because children, they don't harbor malice, they don't hold malice, they forgive very easily. And somehow I don't know where I got this idea from that this is what conversion really means. But there's another aspect to being a child that I believe is more important. And I'm convinced, well I'll demonstrate in a moment that this is what Jesus was talking about. There's one thing about a child that is beautiful a child who is properly trained in a proper family setting. And it is the way he trusts his parents. It's the way he has confidence in what his parents say. Now you can tell when a child has good parents because if a parent says this is right or this is good, the child will obey. But you can tell when a child, his, his, his training is not so good because he wants to resist and oppose and he thinks he knows better than his parents. Now I think Jesus was talking about the good, the properly brought up child when he said, if you don't become converted and become like little children, a little child trusts his parents. I knew. Because when I was growing, when I was growing up, man, if my father said the sky was black, I would deny the evidence of my eyes. When I was a little boy, daddy knew everything and nobody else did. And anything he told me was so. And my, my children grew up like that, you know, it kind of was a little sad when they really came to the age of reality and began to realize I didn't really know everything. <laughs> but I guess all of us hit that place. But there is that quality that is very beautiful about children when they trust their parents totally. And I want to say that Peter, it's amazing that Peter trusted Christ enough to walk on water when Jesus said, come. He trusted Christ enough to, to believe that he was the son of God. He trusted Christ enough that he was ready to cut off the ear of a man. I don't think he was going for the ear at all. You're, nobody's that much of a marksman to aim for the ear and to hit the ear. You know what he was going for, right? Yep, yeah. yeah, he was going for the neck. He was ready to die and to give his life for Christ. And yet I'm going to demonstrate that he did not trust Christ. Really, not really. What Peter trusted was the power of Christ. He trusted Christ's ability to calm the, 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 the raging sea. He trusted Christ's ability to cast out demons and raise the dead and to heal the sick. But he didn't really trust Christ. I'm going to demonstrate it for you. Turn to John chapter 13. Now here we find that this is the time of the Last Supper. Jesus comes into the room where his disciples are and he has a towel and he has a basin with water. And he, he, he stoops down and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. And he's washing everyone. James, John, Thomas, Judas and he's coming down the line. And everybody is quiet. They are kind of awed. But they are, they are quiet and they are they're trying to understand. He comes to Peter. Peter says, Lord, what are you doing? Jesus says, what I'm doing, you don't know now. But what I do, do you will know after this. Now look at verse, verse 6. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Now how did Peter? I mean, Peter has said that this person is whom? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. How does the Son of God come to do something and you presume to tell him that you know better than him? I mean, man, if it were me, I would be awed that he would condescend to wash my dirty feet, but look, I keep my mouth shut, right? I would think I'm going to, I'm going to keep quiet and see what's going on. I'm not going to open my, my mouth. He is God's son. He should know what he's doing. Who am I to oppose and contradict the son of God? But not Peter. You will never wash my feet. I don't know what he's doing. But man, you think, what kind of what kind of attitude does he have in his mind that he he thinks he's being humble, right? 
He thinks he's being humble. He thinks, Jesus, I'm going to show you that I, I regard you as being great and I'm too worthless for you to wash my feet. But in actual fact, what he's doing is putting his wisdom above the wisdom of Christ. So Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And again, Peter is ready to jump in and act like he knows better than Christ. He says, well then, not only my feet, but also my head. And Jesus says, again he corrects him gently. He says, look here, the person who is washed does not need to do anything other than to wash his feet, but he's already clean. And so then Peter is quiet. Now, I chose this example to start with because this is the mildest example I can give you of where Pete, of where of, 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 of Peter's attitude. Let's look at a few other examples. Matthew chapter sixteen. I want to read from verse twenty one. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to do what? Man. I mean that word, that word is very expressive. Rebuke is what you do to somebody who is a child or somebody who is not very smart or somebody who has done something very foolish you know Peter is saying look here why are you discouraging the brethren why are you talking about going up to Jerusalem and, and dying this will never happen to you and Peter knew it would never happen because he was carrying his sword right so it's amazing to me what does it tell you about Peter's relationship with Jesus he believes Jesus can make him walk on water but when it comes to practical things, when it comes to life and how to organize and run things, he thinks like Judas that Jesus is not a very practical person. He believes in the power of Jesus, but not the wisdom of Christ. <coughs> and therefore, he trusts the ability of Christ to do miracles, but he does not trust Jesus enough to commit himself absolutely to the wisdom of Christ that is the mark of the unconverted person that is the person that feels that my dress style even though the Lord advises me this way I know what makes me happiest my appetite the friends I keep the job that I am in that's the kind of person who in a thousand little ways adjusts the counsel of the Lord because he thinks he knows a little bit better you know some time ago I found myself introducing something into my life and you know the most amazing things is how the tiniest things can wrap themselves around us that you can hardly move I mean, for somebody, it might be something as simple as the hairstyle or, or, or the, the jacket that I like. It was something small. I won't even tell you what it is. Maybe not so small. There's nothing small when it absorbs your heart. And the thought came, the Lord does not want you to have this. And I wanted to have it. Jesus did not speak to me. God didn't speak to me. God did not say, I don't want you to have it. But my conscience, right? Now your conscience, you can bend and twist it anyway because the only person who sees your conscience is who? Me and God, right? Only God sees my conscience. The other person is me. I can bend and twist it anyway. I have a lot of practice in it from when I was a child how to bend my conscience and tell myself this is okay with God and silence it eventually. But when you truly desire to be a friend of the Lord, you can't take that road. You can't remain on that road. One day passed. Two days passed. And by the third day I was sick. Of praying dry prayers. 
coming to talk to God and in my heart there's something buttering and saying don't you know what I want and here am I trying to pray to God trying to fool myself trying to deceive myself when this thing is there eating away at me I, I'm choosing my way and not his way and after, after three days I couldn't take it anymore but you know it kind of reminded me of the way we are the way we are so many times we have adopted our own way every one of us in some way or the other we are at fault on this matter and I'm telling you I don't have to ask because Jesus said if a man loves me he will keep my word and that word it does not mean keep the Sabbath it means that is a man who is sensitive to my voice hears me and is ready to die or anything that it takes to have my friendship and he says I will love him and my father will love him and we will come and make our home with that person furthermore he says we will manifest ourselves to him a few days ago man are passing through a rough time right now in a way I was in Germany I was in Europe for four weeks I came back for five days and my wife left and she went to Canada for three weeks and she came back and four days later I, have, I am here in America for two weeks so it's kind of like a rough period of my life but you know when I came when she left for Canada it was the first time in 30 years that my wife ever left me 30 years I've left her and gone about place but it was the first time I was at home without her around now before I was married 30 something years ago I was a master of being alone man I felt like I wanted to be alone a lot so I could be with the Lord and over the years I've told myself I, if I am put in jail or if, if everybody goes away and leaves me alone it will be a most blessed time of my life because I know how to be alone but when she, went, she left and went to Canada I discovered that I was living in the past I was living in a dream that had long ceased to be a reality. I discovered I had lost the gift of being alone. Man, for the first two days I was haunted. I, I just didn't know what to do in this big empty house. Every room I passed I could hear her voice. I was expecting, I'm sitting at the computer and I'm kind of sensitive to watch her passing the door. And I realized that, you know, I would kind of lost that art of being alone but after a few days I started to think about the Lord and he started to grow in my heart and I started to the, the, the thought came the thought came to me God wants this to be a blessing for you because here's an opportunity for you to enter into God's presence and get to know him again as a personal person and I, I used those lonely hours I used them and the Lord I'm happy to tell you that he blessed me one day when I was praying for my brother you know I have a brother who is not a Christian I've been praying for him for, for more than 30 years he used to use drugs I don't know if he still uses it but in all those years he has not become a Christian and I was praying for him you know my mind was kind of drifting here and there and I was thinking Lord you promised to manifest yourself why am I praying to God and my mind is drifting around the place and I realized that this promise came back to me if a man loves me he will keep my word and I will manifest myself to such a person isn't that what we want man I want this. I want to know Jesus in my life every moment every place I go to have the sense of his presence and you know you know the Lord brought this home to my mind David stop praying for your brother just stop praying and I want you to do something I want you to focus on what is true and so I stopped praying and I was alone in the house and I started to try to fill my mind with the truth and what was the truth God is here now we don't know what that means we don't know what that means man God is here 
if, if your mind could grasp that reality for one moment we'll be on our faces if your mind could grasp it and I realize that we, are, we have trained ourselves we have accustomed ourselves to shutting him off and living our normal lives and I realize, realize that walking with Jesus committing myself to him means that everything that I do during the day I focus on God until my life is filled with the sense of his presence then then when he has this full control of my life that's what it means for him to control my life I mean I mean look here we only have human brains right we are not computers that you put yourself in a certain mode and you just run in that mode I get up in the mornings and then I have my prayer time then I study a little bit then I go and exercise then I have breakfast then I might cut the yard then I might go down to the, the office and I might do some work and, and as you go from stage to stage you are living your life but in all of this what God wants us to do is to have an awareness of him because when I'm cutting the yard David shouldn't cut the yard it should be the Lord in me and I, I, need to, I need to get myself in that awareness of what is real and what is true but I, I'm drifting a little bit but the point I want to make is that the only way we can maintain we can, we can obtain and maintain this kind of relationship is where we, are, we, we, we trust him so absolutely that every aspect of our lives is the expression of his will I mean when I put on a pair of shoes it should be because he wants me to wear that pair of shoes a friend of mine says come on man life is going to be tedious that way well I'll tell you when I just got married to my wife it wasn't tedious when I combed my hair I wanted to know if she thought it looked good I think even now I went out with, with, with brother, brother brother Bill brother Van Grit and his wife and they were buying some clothing and he put it on and he came out and said how does it look he wants her approval he needs her to say this looks good before he will buy it we treat our wives like that we treat our partners like that she wants to know does this taste good we, the more we care about each other the more we absorb ourselves in each other the more we are concerned about what, what the other person approves how do we treat God differently and expect him to commit himself, himself to us I mean are our, our partners more real to us than God and is this right is this what it means to be a Christian to put God in the periphery where we have him on prayer meeting night and on Sabbaths and sometimes when we're having family worship and the rest of the time we run our own lives Peter was that kind of person and what he needed to understand was that the only wisdom that matters is the wisdom of Christ Ken may be a master machinist. That doesn't mean he can compare to the wisdom that is Christ. Dr. Van Grit may know nine languages or however many. He is a fool when it comes to the wisdom of Christ. Mark may be a master in his field. But can you do anything? Can you send an email? Can you write a letter? Trusting to your own ability to do this thing. The person who knows what I really am is the person who is beginning to step on the road to conversion. The person who knows what I am and understands what I am in the light of who Christ is is the person who is beginning to step on the road to conversion. The truth is that our pattern is like this. It's the truth we give God our actions but not our hearts it's easy to go to church on Sabbath it's easy to, wear, wear, to, to dress properly it's easy to, to read the right verse it's easy to be, to be nice to my neighbor and to be kind to the poor person that I, I see on the street but he doesn't want our actions he wants our hearts he wants everything and if he cannot have it he will not commit himself to us. We are not a people who believe in, in, in righteousness by works. 
But that's what we give, our actions. Until we are ready to give our hearts. We are not ready to receive him. Isn't that what the Bible teaches in, in, in different language? Jesus says, except a man, except a man, except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die. It remains alone. The Bible talks about death. It talks about a commitment to Christ. So absolute. So uncompromising that the only thing we can compare it to is death. And I'll tell you, death is a frightening thing. I'm afraid of it. I don't want somebody to come in and tell me how to run my life. I know the things that some of us love, right? I know what I love. And I know it's frightening to think, if somebody takes this away from me, am I going to be happy? Don't you trust your creator to know better than you? Or are you like Peter thinking, Lord, I have mapped out a course for my life and Lord, you're going to interfere and take this from me. I will give you my actions, but here I reserve this. And there's nothing wrong with it because the commandments don't say it is wrong. Are you wanting to live on that level just so you can maintain control to go back to the level of the letter of the law? Or do we understand that Christ wants to control our hearts that he may be able to do what he wants with us and through us and that this is the only way? Peter had to learn that lesson. And because Peter didn't learn this lesson, because it took him so long to learn this lesson, man, he had to feel it. Matthew 26, we find another example of the the poor, foolish Peter. And we see why he had to go through such a hard learning experience. In verse 33. In verse 31. Matthew 26. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter, again, of course, with his big mouth. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Who does Peter trust? Peter. Dear me. I mean, Peter thinks he's being loyal, right? He thinks he's saying the right words. Lord, I love you. I won't let you down. This is the Son of God, the Lord of Peter, the one he has confessed, is the one that came from heaven. He says, everybody is going to be offended tonight. Peter says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know who this is. I know myself from when I was a child growing up, and I know the kind of person I am. The only person who knows what you are, brothers and sisters, is Christ. Amen. And we need to come to accept his opinion of who we are. The Bible says, Jesus knows what is in man. Peter should have listened. So Peter says, Lord, you don't know what you are saying. Everybody, James and John, those guys, they're not so strong, but I know myself. I will never be offended because of you tonight. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow, you, Peter, you personally, will deny me three times. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Now you parents, you know what it is like when you say to a child. A child comes home from school and says, Look here, daddy, we all came from monkeys. You say, This is not the truth. And you explain to him and he says, I know you don't know what you are saying. And he contradicts you. You know the feeling you feel. The frustration, the emptiness, the sadness, the desperation. Jesus feels it. He's trying to save Peter from something, right? He's trying to help Peter. And everything he says, Peter contradicts him. Where has Peter learned this from? He has learned it from Peter. It is what is in man. This instinct to think that I know best. This instinct to follow my own way. It is human nature. It is the nature of the unconverted. And like I said, we mask it. We deceive ourselves because we give partially 
We give our actions, maybe 99%, to convince ourselves that we are converted. But all we give is our actions. In our hearts, we still reserve the right to say, thus far and no further. And when we choose our own way in the slightest little thing, we are simply just indicating who really is in control. With Peter, it came out in a, in, in a more open way, in a more gross way, because we see the history of his life over three and a half years, and we know how the story ends. God help us that it won't end that way for any of us. Now, Jesus knew what was in man. Peter did not know. But somebody else knew what was in man. Go back to Luke 22. Somebody else knew. Somebody else knows what is in man. It says again. We read these verses before, but I want to read it again. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Who else knows what is in man? Satan knows. And because Satan knows what is in man, he is preparing something for all of us. Especially those who claim to be Christians. He is preparing something for all of us. Because Satan knows that the unconverted might survive the time of peace. Even when we see the storm building. And we might send out all these CDs and DVDs and newsletters and emails about the coming martial law and, and about the Sunday laws and about the one world government. And we all see it coming but Satan knows what is in man and he knows that these things are not preparing us. The only person who will survive the sifting is the person who has learned the lesson that Christ alone knows what is good. Christ alone is capable of controlling the life. Peter didn't know that, but Satan knew. And so he went to God and he says, You have a man down there walking around with your son named Simon Peter. He calls himself a Christian. He says, Give him to me and I will show you what he's made of. The Bible doesn't record the conversation, but Jesus said that is what happened. Isn't that what he said? Satan went before God and said, Give me Peter and I will show you what he's made of. And Jesus says, I don't know, maybe God revealed it to him in a, in a dream or a vision, but Jesus said, I went and I prayed for you, Peter. Thank God for Jesus. I know he prays for many of us. But man, it was a hard thing that he had to go through before he learned. Think about the things that happened to Peter that night. That night, Jesus trying again. He comes and he says, He takes Peter, James and John and he says, Come with me and pray with me. Now I don't think Jesus needs anybody to pray for him because he's God's son and he knows how to pray. But I think he's thinking about Peter. I have, I have four children, right? I have Angie, Daniel, Dave and Anneli. And here I have my children. Let me use David and his family because they are younger children. Just say for example that, you know, David's wife, she likes to watch his soap operas. And his children like to read comics and they like to hang around with the wrong type of friends. And David knows what is coming and he says, Sweetheart, we, we don't need to be watching this. He doesn't want to be a dictator. But he tries to say, Sweetheart, we need to spend more time in prayer. We need to spend more time seeking the Lord. But his wife loves these soap operas and she thinks he's a Christian because she goes to church on Sabbath, right? And the children do study their Sabbath school lessons, right? But he sees the need for something more and he's saying, please let us be more concerned about spiritual things. But they don't. And that's what is happening to Jesus because these are his children. He says to Peter, come and pray with me. What does Peter do? He goes to sleep. The Son of God says, come and pray. And he goes to sleep. What did you do if Jesus says to you, come and pray? Man, I would pray about a week. I wouldn't stop. One night my father, my father tells me that when he was in college, 
He used to get up with another friend of his to pray in the mornings at 4 o'clock. And then he started finding it hard to get up so early and so he started sleeping, oversleeping and missing the appointment. And he said one morning he was lying in bed and he felt a hand fall on his shoulder. And he opened his eyes. He saw nobody but he heard a voice and the voice says, Get up, get up and pray. God loves you and wants to save you. But Satan hates you and wants to destroy you. And the hand hit him again and the voice said, when God called you, get up and pray. He said he jumped to his feet, wide awake. And he felt the hand still on his shoulder. He went and awakened his friend. When they finished praying, the friend said to him, what was it? He didn't need to say a word. The way he prayed that morning, his friend knew something had happened. Now the Son of God says to Peter, come and pray with me. And he goes to sleep. And Jesus is concerned because he knows what is coming and he wants Peter to be prepared and so he says pray and he comes and finds them sleeping and he says what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now he's, he's clearly referring to Peter's statement earlier on. He's saying what? You Peter who are going to die for me? You Peter who will never betray me? You can't even watch with me one hour? He goes away and he prays again and he comes back and he's so discouraged he says Okay, sleep on. Sleep on. Take your rest. You know, he's being a little sarcastic. He's, he's so discouraged to find that these people who claim to love him, they can't even stay up to pray with him for a little bit. That's the extent of our love, right? Words! But when it comes to true relationship, I tell you, when my wife was away and I was alone in that house, I felt the presence of God a little better. And when, and then, I wanted to pray. Every moment I wanted to pray. I wanted him to go to the bathroom with me. I wanted him to wash the dishes with me. I wanted him to cut the grass with me. Everywhere I went, I tried to remember him. And when I forgot him for a moment, I felt a bit of grief. Jesus wants us. He wants to be integrated into our lives. But it's not going to happen when we reserve little spots where we have to put him aside for a moment. And we have practiced and trained ourselves into this kind of lifestyle. Until we think it is normal. But we have to recognize brothers and sisters. That maybe we are not really converted. That night. Peter depended on himself. Because he still didn't trust God. When, they, when everything happened exactly as Christ had predicted. He pulled his sword to resist the thing that Christ had said would happen. When Jesus told him finally. In bitter in bitter disappointment. Put up your sword. Those who take the sword will perish with the sword. He ran away. And then the Bible says. The next thing that happened. When we follow our own wisdom. The Bible says. In some of the most. I don't know what to call it. They are cutting words. But I think the Bible is so deliciously simple. In how it states things. It says. And Peter followed. Where? Afar off. Man, I think, I, I, I find that so beautiful, so delightful. Because whoever wrote this could have said, and Peter followed. But the Bible says he followed afar off. Because I think God wants us to know that when you follow Jesus in your way, there is no other way that you can follow but afar off. And when you follow Jesus, Jesus afar off, inevitably, the next thing you do, you take your seat with the enemies of Christ. That's exactly what Peter did. Because when you're falling afar off, you don't want to hold up your flag. You don't want it to be known who you are. You're falling at a distance. You can't let him go, but you can't keep too close. Because where he is, is just a little bit too hot. You know, like the song says, Howard and I, we got the words of a song in Europe. And I, I, I like the words. It says, all that I would do, I could do, I could have. The kind of faith that it takes to step out of this boat and then... Onto the crashing waves. To step out of my comfort zone. Into the arms of the unknown. Where Jesus is. And he's calling out to me. But the waves are calling out my name. And they say to me. Boy. You'll never win. No you'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. 
I don't remember the next line. <laughs> the voice of truth says, Do not be afraid. Of all the voices calling out to me, I, will, I have chosen to listen to and believe the voice of truth. But that's what it is. Jesus is out there in the unknown. Where he is, is frightening. But it's where he is. And he holds out his hand and he says, Come. But it's frightening to step into the unknown. It's frightening to step out into the dark where there are dangers and you don't know what is out there. You can only see the hand and you hear the voice say, Come. Man, it's so much safer when I plan and work it out and organize my life. Jesus only says, Trust me. Peter trusted himself, so he took the human way. He took the way of safety. He planned it out, and he went there with his little sword still. And I think he must have been planning another coup. Because he was hiding, and he went and he took his place with the enemies of Christ, while John went in boldly and stood in the corner. The next thing that happens is that the Lord of Peter is suffering bitter cold. Where does Peter find himself? He goes by the fire, keeping himself warm. Man, he isn't able to go out there in the dark with Christ. Because he's following Peter's wisdom. Our wisdom always takes us where it is safest. And you can see now, as you look at it, you see all the evidences that Peter was not converted. And you see from the very beginning how he was riding for a fall. Because he was trusting Peter's wisdom. But the wonderful thing is that the cock finally crew the third time. And Peter awakened like a man out of a dream. You know, like you're trying to remember something and you hear a word on the radio. Or you see something, a flower. Or you see a bird fly and suddenly it comes back to your mind. And the first thing he did, as soon as the rooster crowed the third time, he remembered he had heard him crow before. He flashes around and he looks at Jesus. And all he sees are these eyes looking at him. He sees a deep sorrow and disappointment in those eyes. And yet, they are still so full of love. The Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. Mercifully, I think God veils the details from our eyes. I think if it was not for the grace of God, if it were not for the prayer of Christ, you know what might have happened that night? I think he might have gone and hung himself like Judas. Because finally, you know who Peter saw that night? Peter. Finally, he saw Peter. And when Jesus looked at him, finally, he saw Jesus. And it was too much for him to take. He was broken in pieces. And he went out. And that night, Peter was converted. Because he saw Jesus, finally. And he saw himself, finally. Do you know what you really are. Do you know what capabilities lie in your heart? I hear Brother Dwight saying. What a terrible sinner he is. And I echo the words. But when you have come to this place. You must also add to it. What a wonderful savior Jesus is. Don't stop there. With what a terrible sinner you are. Wonderful. May every one of us get to that place. But don't stop there. Finish up by recognizing what a wonderful Savior Jesus is. Amen. It's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's poignant. It's, it's, it's thrilling. When a few days later, Jesus comes to Peter on the shore. Peter is holding his head down, shame like a dog. Jesus, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, he calls Peter's name. And Peter's heart misses a beat. And his ears go up. And every sense is alert. But his head is down. He says, do you love me more than these? Every word of the betrayal comes back to Peter's mind. Every step of his self-will comes back to his mind. His head is still hanging. He says, Lord, yes, I love you. But his, his heart is condemning him and saying, you liar. He knows that you're a liar. He has had the proof of it. A few minutes pass and then Jesus says again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And how, how, this, how the knife strikes deeper in Peter's heart. He says, Lord, yes, I love you. 
Three times Peter denied Christ. Jesus asks again the third time, Peter, do you love me more than these? And finally Peter says it. He expresses it, what Jesus wants to hear. Lord, you know everything. He has learned his lesson. You know everything. You know that I love you. Brothers and sisters, we can give our lives to somebody who knows everything. How can we do less? How can we be safe any other way? He knows everything. What do you know? I don't even know what will make me happy. I have pursued happiness all my life. And for more than half, well, for the first half of my life, all I was chasing was a dream. I thought I would find happiness here. I only found bitterness and disappointment. I don't even know what is good for me. He knows all things. God help us to trust him absolutely that we give ourselves without reservation. Nothing. Nothing. No point in our lives. Nothing in our lives. No cherished thing. No friend. No hobby. That we say, Lord, here, I choose to keep this. No. It is when we die that he lives. Isn't that what the Bible says? If we die with him, we shall live with him. He that is dead is freed from sin. Jesus sets us free. Jesus lives his life. But only in those who choose the way of death. We cannot kill ourselves. But we can make the choice. And when we make the choice, he will take us into that experience of his death. When we have truly made that choice. Without deceiving ourselves. And so brothers and sisters, I hope that in what I've said tonight, we have been able to see a little bit of, a little bit more clearly of what might be an obstacle in the way of Christ's full working in our lives. It's interesting when you look at Peter's life after that, right? The little cowardly Peter was ready to follow Christ at a distance, was ready to flee that night. A few days later, he went into the temple preaching. They took him. And they said, speak no more in this name. He said, we ought to be God rather than men. So they beat him and they locked him up and put him in jail. The angel came and opened the door and said, go speak to the people all the words of this life. The next morning they go to look for Peter. He's not in prison. Then after a while they come and said, the men that you arrested, they are back at the same exact spot where you locked them up yesterday, preaching the same exact thing that you commanded them not to speak. This is equivalent, Mark, to the to the ATF, or what's the most terrible little group you have here? They come and they break down your door and they come in your house and they say, they confiscate your literature. They break into your church and they tell you, they put a cease and desist order there. And the next day they come and everything is back in place and you are standing right there in defiance of them preaching just the same. Not many people will do that. Peter did. And when they beat him, the Bible says they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And they took note of them that they had been with Christ. There is a difference when we are converted. But conversion is contingent upon coming to that acknowledgement that Christ is everything and I am nothing. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. And I hope that what he has said tonight may find root in the heart of each one of us, myself not, accept, not accepted. Let us pray. Father, I appreciate you being with us tonight. I appreciate you helping us to recognize your presence. Thank you so much, Lord, for the Blessed and wonderful way you bring truth home to our minds. And give us what we need and help us to understand where we are lacking. Thank you, Father. We appreciate you, but we hope and want to appreciate you much more. We want to love you, Father, best of all. We pray that you continue to take us to that place. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.